Good morning, Hub City Church, and happy Mother's Day to all the moms here with us. We're so glad you've decided to join us in worship this morning. If you're new to Hub City, we exist to make disciples who believe the gospel, abide in Christ, and obey the word of God. If you'd like more information about our vision, if you'd like to get connected to biblical community through groups, or if you'd like to find an opportunity to serve the body of Christ with us, you can visit our website, thehubcitychurch.org, or just text the word Hub City to 97000 and we'll follow up with you in the next few days. Ladies, we hope you will join us for brunch on Saturday, May 20th at 10 a.m. for a time of food and fellowship. We'll continue our summer schedule with our May Play Day on Sunday, May 28th. In lieu of community groups, we will have a fellowship in our backyard with burgers, birthday cake, and a giant water slide to celebrate our church's 15-year anniversary. We hope you'll make plans to join us for that, as well as all of the fun fellowship and outreach opportunities we'll have this summer. As we get ready to enter into corporate worship, if you're worried about having little ones in service with you, we want you to be at ease. We love kids and have a lot of them here. There are coloring sheets in the back of the sanctuary. Our kids ministry is always available to you. And we have a nursing mother's room with our service streaming live just outside the lobby to the left. Again, we're so glad you're here. Let's worship Jesus together. Right. Well, hey, uh, happy Mother's Day again to all of the mothers who are here this morning. My name is Pastor Tad. I'm the lead teaching pastor here uh, at the Hub City Church, and so we're glad you're here to worship with us today, um, especially the moms. Happy Mother's Day. We're so thankful for you. Uh, what you do day in and day out is incredibly humbling uh, to all of the men in this room who have ever had to be responsible for children for longer than a few hours. Amen, brothers? Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, moms, you have not only one of the hardest jobs, but one of the most important jobs, and it is more than a job. Really, it's a role and a responsibility that has been divinely delegated to you by God himself. So, uh, moms, we love you, and we hope that you feel cared for and appreciated today and every day, really. Hopefully you got the gift that we had for you when you came in the doors. If not, we'll get you one on the way out. And really, I'd say this even to the ladies uh, who, are, who are here who are not or just not yet mothers. In Genesis, uh, Eve is referred to as the mother of all living prior to having children, actually. So we acknowledge and we do appreciate the nurturing motherly qualities that even you contribute to our church family as well. So thank you for that. Um, just a few few recaps on our summer schedule. Uh, my wife did mention this in her welcome, but Ladies Brunch is going to be next Saturday, May 20th at 10 a.m. Uh, we hope that you will join them. It's going to be a good time of uh, food and fellowship and lady stuff. So have, have fun with that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean like flowers and, you know, I mean <laughs> tablecloths, all that stuff the men's, men's breakfast didn't have, you know. <sighs> So anyway, um, <laughs> and then the, uh, the other thing we're working on right now is our May Play Day. We got that in the works, and uh, pastoral assistant David here wants you to know we have a really big water slide ready to go, all lined up, and burgers and birthday cake to celebrate 15 years as a church together. That's on, yep, Sunday, May 28th at 4 p.m. Hope you'll join us. Uh, as we celebrate then as well. Uh, just another quick thing, uh, we will break from our regular community group um, meeting schedule. Um, so on the 28th, that celebration is in lieu of community group. And then from there, uh, you know, June, July through about the first half of August, uh, we take a break from community groups just because uh, we have a, a summer schedule, but people are often traveling and things like that. And so we'll give it a break and then we'll come back at the end of August. Okay. Back when uh, we'll get back when school starts. So just want to let you know on that as well. And uh, now we are continuing on in our 
our series in Ephesians, right? Um, we're on week two, and uh, we've titled this series, as Josh said, Life Together in Christ, because the first half of the letter is a lengthy and beautiful articulation of gospel doctrine, and the back half of the letter is mostly application of that doctrine to individuals, families, and churches who are doing life together in Christ, right? So anyway, last week we, we started with a, a small section of the first chapter because uh, in the Apostle Paul's introducing of himself, he said that he was an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of of God. And that doctrine of the will of God is a really important one that's going to uh, pop back up again and again in this letter. And so we took some time to settle some really foundational and yet critical truths regarding God's will, namely um, that his will is specific and that all of us are in it. Okay, uh, And thus I gave the exhortation to consider that seriously and ask the question to ourselves of um, if we are truly as concerned as we should be that we would walk in step with God's specific will for us. And this morning we're going to continue <clears throat> with the next small section of text in chapter 1 because Paul is uh, going to drop some just uh, mind-blowing realities on us that relate to God's will for us as believers and followers of Christ. So let's do this. Let's read the text and then we'll pray and then we'll do our best to wrap our minds uh, and our hearts around it. Okay, so um, Ephesians 1, I'm going to go ahead and start from verse 1 actually uh, there just to get the full flow of it. So um, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus, and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In case you didn't notice, this is a monumental three verses of the Bible. Um, there are promises so big and implications so wide, it is a fearful thing uh, for me to take these verses up today and, and hope to do them justice. So let's pray, and, and as we do, friends, if this is not your habit, um, would you also pray for me um, that I would be faithful to expound on these nearly unfathomable things we just read about uh, our relationship to God. Okay, so let's, let's pray, and we'll, we'll get into it. Father, you are amazingly good and glorious. We praise you for the things you have generally revealed about yourself to us, a, a beautiful spring day, the blessing of, of mothers in our lives. These are common graces that you have bestowed on all people to show us what you're like, and we certainly praise and, and thank you for them. But Lord, more than that, we thank and praise you for your special revelation of yourself in your word. <clears throat> God, things that we would never know about you were it not for the preservation of your written testimonies and at the pinnacle, the good news of your son, Jesus, who came to save sinners through faith alone. And now, God, as we delve into some specifics of that gospel message and the divine plan of it all, would you cause us to be in awe of you? And not simply that... You have loved us, but for how long and how intentionally you have specifically loved each one of us. Though you are sovereign over all time and creation, you're not like a celebrity who just generally and clichely claims to love their fans. You are a perfect father who has uniquely and sweetly loved each of his children dearly before they even knew him. 
Would these truths just overwhelm us this morning in a fresh way, Lord, and stir us up to a greater intentionality in our lives and in our faith. Help me, Holy Spirit, as always, to say all that you would have me to say and nothing that you wouldn't for the glory of Christ and the joyful upbuilding of these men and women, his church. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, well, because of what this text says, because it's so massive and theologically dense, I want to begin the exposition of it by trying to get us into the right headspace to receive its truths with the appropriate level of awe and concern, okay? Um, If you know me, you know I try to pay pretty close attention to our culture because uh, when I teach the Bible, I think it's important to do so in a relevant way or a way that is cognizant of the issues that we're facing real time. One, uh, one liberal theologian who I disagree with on almost everything said that we ought to preach, the Bi- preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And on that, I agree, not because uh, we should ever take the news as divinely inspired truth, but because what's happening around us um, should be considered for right contextualization and application. So um, on that train of thought, let me share with you two seemingly unrelated uh, modern statistics that, that I think, when observed side by side, should help us to grab hold of Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, and cherish it deeply. Okay, um, Here's the first one. There's a new term that's been coined over about the past 10 years or so. It's called extended or prolonged adolescence. And it's uh, pretty self-explanatory. People are taking longer to grow up than ever before. While 18 remains the culturally accepted age of official adulthood, the majority of 18 to 20-year-olds do not embody the adult qualities of maturity and responsibility. And Unless we attempt to explain this away with the difficulty of the you know, post-pandemic economy, this phenomenon was happening well before 2020. Okay, um, Rather than a time to learn how to stand up on their own and begin building a life of providing for themselves and caring for others, a spouse, children, right? Statistically speaking, uh, the ages of 18 to 24 are more of a time to kind of float around with little direction, having uninhibited fun, uh, with very little responsibility to figure things out in your own way, in your own time, with no one who can tell you otherwise. It's been said that uh, the average age of marriage in the U.S., It's quickly approaching 30 years old. And so people are intentionally choosing to have less kids later in life than ever before in favor of spending the better part of a decade of biological maturity to unintentionally do a deep dive into societal immaturity, right? Overindulgence and things like video games, partying, and other likewise unproductive endeavors. You've probably already uh, seen this happening. Maybe you just didn't know there was a term for it. Well, there is. uh, Extended adolescence. But here's the other statistic on the other end of the spectrum, if you will. Um, For the first time since the 1920s, the average life expectancy of American adults has actually gone down, right? With technological, medical, and health knowledge advancements, life expectancy a few years ago, It was approaching 80 years old. It's now trending back down towards 75. And in case you're thinking, well, that's probably due to COVID, right? Um, Actually, independent of COVID-related deaths, things like heart disease, drug overdose, and suicide are are actually way up uh, right here in the most prosperous and advanced nation in the world. And so um, the window of productive and meaningful adult life is kind of closing in on both sides. And I would argue from a Christian worldview perspective that the reason for this narrowing time frame has a lot to do with one key idea. Purpose. Purpose. When people lack a sense of purpose and meaning... And identity, I think it naturally follows that they care less about 
and even avoid growing up. And oftentimes, as a result of never figuring those things out, they die prematurely. Heart disease that literally happens from many people eating themselves to death, drug overdose, alcohol abuse-related death, suicide, all of these stem fundamentally from either a careless or an aimless way of living. And while we all might chuckle a bit, at the caricature of the man-boy still living at home with mom, spending his days wearing a headset and a pretend command center stocked with Mountain Dew and Cheetos, seriously committed to defeating pretend threats in a pretend world where he's the pretend hero, right? We should not pretend that that stereotype is the only one wandering about wasting precious years of life without purpose. There are many ways to squander a life, some of them a lot more attractive or culturally acceptable than others. As C.S. Lewis famously quipped, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. In short, the point he's making is that God's desire is not that we would drift through life confused, but confident, not aimless but on purpose regarding what he has for us. And that, in fact, the purpose that God desires for us to have is much more fulfilling than the truncated, inferior, worldly endeavors that we try to craft for ourselves without God. For for this reason, John Piper in his book, Don't Waste Your Life, urges, desire that your life count for something. Desire that your life count for something great. Long for, long for this, right? For eternal significance. Want this. Don't coast through life without passion. And church, I, I would lay before you that Ephesians 1, 3 through 6 is a text that will give you a passion to live your life on purpose. Later in Ephesians, Paul's going to make a case that following Jesus is actually what grows people up into the kind of maturity in life that they were meant to have. You see, because as we follow Jesus, he brings us into the knowledge of the truest and most important realities of our existence. So that when the question arises of what it is our life is about, and what we're doing with it. We're not like that new viral meme of the guy who's like, nothing. Me? Just hanging around, right? Guys, that meme is funny, but it's not God's design for you to just be hanging around. Ephesians 1 says, God in his good pleasure and for his glory has both sealed and revealed the destiny of all who are in Christ. God in his good pleasure and for his glory has both sealed and revealed the destiny of all who are in Christ. This phrase, in Christ, it's all through the New Testament, okay, all over the New, all over the New Testament, it's, it's the scriptural phrase that we doctrinally understand as union with Christ. Okay, Union with Christ. And the life of someone who's united to Christ, who's in Christ, looks like someone who has first and foremost believed the gospel. Believed the gospel. That is, someone who has believed that Jesus Christ lived and died for them. Do, do you believe that? That's right. 
that Jesus came in human flesh to live a perfect life and then impute or credit his righteousness to your account. And that he died on the cross, not because he was a criminal or because he couldn't get out of it if he wanted to, but because as the Son of God, he was the only one who could choose to lay down his life as a sacrifice that would adequately atone or pay for your sin. (laughs) And then that he literally and historically rose from the grave, defeating death, in order to show that he was the only one competent to be your Savior and that he's the only one worthy of being submitted to as your Lord. (laughs) If you believe that, not like, yeah, sure, I believe that, but like, yes, I believe that, and I want to live for that good news, then you're in Christ. You're in Christ. You're united to Christ in his death. And so you have died to sin, no longer enslaved to it, and no longer on the hook for punishment because of it. And you've been born again into new life with new desires and to live in ways that please him and that are shaped by his teachings. And our text this morning says that if you are in Christ, then God in his good pleasure and for his glory has both sealed and revealed your destiny. Thanks, Ron. I don't know. Sometimes it's like just you and me. I don't know. But it seems, it seems like something to go whoo about, I think. <laughs> These verses in Ephesians 1 are some of the most concrete in all the Bible for the doctrines of election and predestination. And and listen, I I know that sometimes people get a little weird and can get upset about those words. But two things before we talk about them, okay? Number one, they're in the Bible. Look down at your Bible and see. I didn't make this up. These are God's words, not mine. That's the first thing. And number two, the second thing is these are beautiful truths, not truths that we're supposed to fight about. These are beautiful truths. Paul meant for you to hear these things and not get upset, but to praise God for them. Okay? That if you are in Christ... That's because God chose you. God chose you before the foundation of the world, not because of anything you've done, but simply because he loves you. And he determined to adopt you into his family. That phrase in verse 5, in love he predestined us, For adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Get this, according to the purpose of his will. That could literally be translated for his good pleasure. (laughs) For his good pleasure. So he chose you and predestined you to be his son or his daughter because he's glorious, because he wanted to. He wanted to. This is how adoption works, isn't it? (laughs) Children without parents don't go down to the family dollar and pick out a family, right? Families who have more love to give take orphans into their home and graciously determine to bestow all the rights and privileges to them of a biological child. That's adoption. And this is what God did. This is what God did. He chose us in love. And then he took all of the blessings that Jesus, his only son, deserved, and he made them ours as well. (laughs) And as you know, adoption usually comes with a high cost. And through Jesus, God paid 
the price in full for our adoption. Maybe you're here today, and if you were honest, you struggle with knowing or maybe believing about what God thinks of you, right? Knowing it and really believing it. Maybe you even consider yourself a Christian, but you walk around carrying a just a kind of a low-grade sense of guilt all the time. That maybe God's just putting up with you, but that it's kind of begrudging to him, right? Because you're such a screw-up. And that maybe at some point, you'll be too much of a hassle, and he'll change his mind about you. Maybe you wouldn't articulate it that way, but as I say it, maybe you're realizing you, you kind of walk around feeling this way, guilty all the time, even though you call yourself a Christian. Friend, if you've ever felt that way, let me tell you something that you need to hear. Your feelings are wrong. Your feelings are wrong. I know our culture says you can't ever say that and it'd be loving, but watch this. <laughs> Your feelings are wrong if you feel that way. God loves you. God loves you. He chose you before the foundation of the world. So he loved you before anyone else ever even conceived of a you. And he loved you so much that that in Christ, he determined that he would make you his forever. And there's no changing that. What God does, man cannot undo. (laughs) Maybe you remember this from Romans 8. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So good. I want to go back to Romans 8. It's so good. But Ephesians 1 is good too, right? We see this language of, of God's choosing all throughout the Bible. 2 Thessalonians 2 says, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. James 2, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. John 15, Jesus himself says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. This is not just a New Testament idea. Even in the Old Testament, God says to his people in Deuteronomy 7, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. So, you see, here's the beauty of being chosen by God because of his love and for his glory. You didn't do anything to deserve it in the first place. And so you can't blow it or mess it up or lose it. If you could... You would. (laughs) I would. (laughs) I'd be dropping that thing all over the place, losing it more than my keys. But you can't. You can't. I love what Charles Spurgeon says about this. He says, I believe 
the doctrine of election because I'm quite sure that if God had not chosen me, I should never have chosen him. I'm sure he chose me before I was born or else he never would have chosen me afterwards. And he must have elected me for reasons unknown to me, for I never could find any reason in myself why he should have looked upon me with special love. (laughs) So if you are in Christ, Ephesians 1 says that God in his good pleasure and for his glory has both sealed and revealed your destiny. This truth is meant to be life-changing. This is radical stuff, right? This is radical stuff. This is stuff where you, you leave and, and you forget what you wanted to eat for lunch because maybe you need to alter the trajectory of your life. If you're a Christian or you want to follow Christ, God has revealed what your whole existence is meant to be about. You were made to be his. You were made to be his. Chosen before the world existed to be adopted into his family. To live every second of the rest of your eternity joyfully for his glory. And this, I hope you see, this totally trumps any lame, immature conception of what we were trying to make our lives about before Christ, right? (laughs) It's as though God has graciously said to you, Chris Pratt's line from the Avengers movie a while back, "Uh, good that you have a plan, except um, it sucks. So let me me do the plan. (laughs) Let me do the plan, and then it'll be really good, okay? Sorry for saying sucks, but mom. (laughs) Seriously, your plan... And my plan was not great. And God's plan for you is amazing. (laughs) Okay? Before we close, I want to give you two parts of the plan that we see in our text. As deeply loved, adopted children of God, he has destined, first of all, that we would inherit his family fortune. That we would inherit his family fortune. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This is emphatic. Every means every. Okay? (laughs) We've already discussed that due to our adoption, all that belongs to Christ will also belong to us. In some sense, full transparency, I think much of this is difficult for us to grasp at this juncture because we are still on this side of eternity. And the eternal spiritual blessings of seeing Christ face to face, living forever with him in a new heavens and a new earth where sin is no more and we get to reign with him, Like, it it doesn't fully compute to us here and now, right? Scripture tells us, it comforts us in that, actually. No eye has seen or human mind been able to conceive fully of what he has prepared for us then. I read a story, though, from back in 2009 of two Hungarian brothers who were homeless. They were living in a, a cave outside of Budapest, who in order to get by, they would find and they would resell just scraps, just junk that they found in the street. One day, they were tracked down and approached by an attorney who informed them that they had a maternal grandmother who had recently passed, and they were both the rightful heirs of her estate. Her estate that rang in around $7 billion dollars. <laughs> Billion with a B. <laughs> I'm sure many of us, upon seeing the billboards with the posted Powerball numbers, have at least momentarily wondered what we would even do if that sum of money, multiple billions of dollars, were suddenly in our account and at our disposal. There's hardly a way to know, right? But to go from homeless 
to a multi-billionaire overnight. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And this is the spiritual equivalent of what has happened to all who are in Christ. We were orphans. And like those Hungarian brothers, right? All the stuff we have, it's like we're just trash scavengers who've come to find out that in Christ, we now have a father who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, as the psalmist says. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 captures this perfectly. Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Church in Christ, we are spiritually rich. And in the same way that we might sometimes have the, the fleeting thought of, what would I do if some exorbitant amount of material wealth were suddenly mine? This scenario is not hypothetical in the spiritual sense. It has happened for us who are in Christ, and so we should give serious consideration to how that should make our lives different now. And in case you're unsure, it's laid out for us in Scripture already. In 1 Timothy 6, speaking to the materially rich, which, I mean, statistically we are, okay, in America, so this applies to us. Paul says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So as those who've had the most incredible good done to us by God through Christ, we should thus turn and do good to others. Right. We should be generous people willing to share. The material, provision, the material provision that we have, yes, but also ready to share the riches of the gospel with anyone and everyone who will listen, which we're doing, by the way. We're out of ping pong balls, so, so yeah, we're doing that, right? So we need to keep doing that, sharing the gospel with anyone and everyone who will listen. They, too, might share in our inheritance, of God's family fortune. It's a well-known fact that billionaires are some of the most charitable people in terms of amounts given. And so as spiritual billionaires, we should strive for people who come into contact with us to be blessed with the spiritual blessings that we have received. Okay, So that's the first part of the destiny of those who have been chosen and adopted in Christ. And finally... Not only are we to inherit his family fortune, but we're also to bear his family legacy. Bear his family legacy. Verse 4 says, He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. You may have heard this before, but it's a really sad reality that the majority of people who wind up winning the lottery actually in relatively short order find themselves in debt. And in some cases, they're found dead due to tragic circumstances. And to put it simply, it's because they didn't know how to steward the great wealth that they had suddenly come into. And so it went sideways on them, right? But in our case, God has not just given us the riches of his grace and left us with no direction. He has clearly outlined for us in Christ, in his word, and by proxy through his church, how we are to carry ourselves now that we have such a legacy. He says we're to be holy and blameless. That is, set apart in a morally upright, dignified grace-filled way of living. Okay? We see this reiterated all through, all through the New Testament as well, that grace is more than just forgiveness. Okay? Grace is more than just forgiveness. It's power for living a transformed life in and for Christ. And 1 Peter 
He says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Moving on to chapter 2 of 1 Peter, he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. 2 Corinthians 7, we could do this all day. Since we have, we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Right? So I don't have time to fully outline holy living right here and now, but we will get into a lot of that as we continue on through Ephesians. But as we close, I want to do exactly what I did last week. I just want to lay this question out for you. Do you know your destiny? Do you know your destiny? So many people, and more by the day, drift through this life without purpose, without meaning, without identity, and without passion. And they might not be living with their mom, wasting all their time on video games, but they're just as aimless, focused on temporal things only. New car, vacation, Amazon purchases, you know, typical American stuff. But they're not ever giving critical thought to what it's all for. Why they're here and what comes after this. But Ephesians 1 says, because of Christ, that doesn't have to be you. That doesn't have to be you. You can know your destiny. You can know your destiny. And just want to tell you, people come into this room every week and they hear this gospel about how they can inherit the family fortune and bear the family legacy of God because of Jesus. And many leave like they're no different. It could be theirs by faith, but they walk away not thinking about the trajectory of their life, but being more concerned about the trajectory of their lunch plans. Okay. And so I'm just putting this out there. If you're ever interested in talking more about what it means to be in Christ, like for real, okay, and really living in step with his will for you to the praise of his grace, I would love to talk with you about that. I'd be more than happy to grab coffee with you or lunch with you to talk about that or any of our leaders for that matter would love to do that, or whoever brought you to church today would love to do that, all right? This is (laughs) life-changing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for your word. God, these are glorious, glorious truths that we have read about just now. Mind-blowing. Thanks for getting our attention. (laughs) God, These are mind-blowing promises. I pray that by your Spirit, these truths wouldn't short out our finite minds this morning, but that you would give us the capacity by your Spirit to grasp them, to behold them, to be in awe of them, and for them to really change us by your grace, God. We love you. We thank you for Ephesians. We pray that you continue to show us glorious things as we move ahead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.